Good morning friends. It's Steve from Southern Illinois. It's a noisy day in Southern Illinois today. The crop duster from our local airport is out and busy at work. He's made a couple passes over our house already so I don't think he'll be back directly here but um, yeah you're gonna hear the droning in the background uh, along with the Katie Dids because Katie Did season has started here in Southern Illinois and uh, while some folks complain about the periodical cicadas um, Katie Dids can be just as deafening and they happen every year <clears throat> otherwise it's a beautiful day 1927 A 19 year old young man from New York City was on his way to Europe. Now this was in the days before airliners so he was getting onto a steamship and it would take uh, I think it was at least seven days to cross the Atlantic so he got onto the steamship and um, the steward showed him to his room and as the steward left, Robert heard the lock on the door click. And when he went over and tried the door, he was locked into his cabin. And there he stayed. The next morning, uh, the steward came, unlocked the door, led him to breakfast, and then took him for a walk around the deck on a leash and when he had done his short exercise routine the steward deposited him in a deck chair and told him to stay put and the steward stayed nearby and uh, periodically uh, passengers would see him there and invite him to go for a walk but the steward always interrupted them and said no I need to keep an eye on him he felt totally confined and constrained. You see, when Robert was six, a horse riding accident had robbed him of his vision in his left eye. When he was 16, a boxing match resulted in him losing vision in his right eye. He was totally blind. And the steward thought that since he was blind, well, the steward felt pr responsible for him. I mean, what would happen if he wandered around the ship and fell overboard? What would happen to the steward if this blind passenger fell overboard? And so he went out of his way to make sure that Robert stayed safe, but in so doing, treated him like a piece of luggage or an animal. Robert was still adjusting to his blindness. He, he still mourned his loss of freedom. And he had heard about a woman in Switzerland who was training dogs to lead World War I veterans who had lost their sight and allow them independence and mobility. And so he had written to her and asked if she would help him and offered to introduce the concept to the United States. <laughs> In today's world of the internet and instantaneous media, this seems bizarre, but a hundred years ago, that was reality. He went to Switzerland. He was assigned a dog named Buddy. He and Buddy trained together, and two years later, Buddy and Robert returned to New York City, where Robert put on a demonstration for newspaper reporters to introduce the concept of the seeing eye dog to the United States. And he went to a busy intersection in New York City. Now, I've never been to New York City, but I've been in cities with multi-lane traffic, and 
without stoplights, remember this is before electrification, <laughs> without a stoplight he stepped off the curb and Buddy led him across multiple lanes of traffic flawlessly. <laughs> the reporters had marked difficulty in following him. In fact, some of them even flagged down a taxi to take them to the other side of the street. It was just prudent. But this seeing eye dog gave Robert the freedom to walk through the traffic. That was the beginning of the seeing eye dog, as it's called here in America. Our study guide today. <laughs> Sorry, I should have. Let me see here. I'll flip it around here. I think I can still do that. Yeah, this is going to be weird for you, but uh, so be it. Now you can read it. Discover the, the, these guides that I'm I'm following uh, as we explore a spiritual life are called the Discover Guides. And this week's title is A Mysterious Power in My Life. The topic is the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're still listening, then I'm going to make an assumption here. You're open to adding a religious element to your spiritual life, or you've already embraced the concept of God and His personal compare, compassion and interest in you. Today we come to a key touchstone in the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is ubiquitous throughout the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word for spirit was the same word that was used for breath and a puff of wind, a gentle breeze. In the Old Testament, it communicates the essence, the life force, that which animates both a human and God. And it's interesting that this, this concept was not unique to the Hebrews. It was a concept that was common in the ancient world. The Greek shares the same, same linguistic pattern that breath and spirit use the same word. You can no more have God without spirit than you can have life without breath. And this, in, this understanding is still embedded in the English language today. When we talk about inspire and inspiration, that can either mean an idea, a thought, that seems to come out of nowhere, or it can mean to breathe in. And the word comes from the Latin inspire, which meant, which was used for both breathing and the spirit, and it was used uniquely when a divine spirit imparted knowledge or a gift to someone. Today we use it in both literal and figurative terms. We talk about inspired writings or inspired artwork, even in our secular society. And on the flip side, what? how do we describe it when somebody dies? They expire, they breathe their last. You see, linguistically, we still equate spirit and breath. In the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came upon you, things happened. Okay? Life was created. God breathed inspire into clay and it became a human being. Uh, craftsmen became unparalleled masters when the Spirit came upon them. Heroes conquered against unimaginable forces. 
prophet spoke the unknowable and saw the unimaginable. But one thing is certain in the Old Testament. This was not a common experience. It only happened to the chosen, the anointed. It wasn't everybody's experience. And yet, the prophets gave promise of a future that was different. In Isaiah 62, verse 1, Isaiah speaks of an anointed one, one who has the Spirit of God in him who would write all injustice, heal all disease, conquer death, wipe away all tears and suffering. Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 and 27 talks about the Spirit of God transforming hearts to the point where we will no longer teach each other because each of us will experience God in us and know God personally. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 foretells a time when the Spirit of God would fall upon young and old men and women free and slave it didn't matter what your status was the Spirit of God would be available to everyone and the New Testament is all about that promise being fulfilled Jesus proclaimed himself, announced himself in the words of Isaiah. Well, got another airplane coming past. He announced himself in the words of Isaiah, the Spirit of God, of God is upon me. And then proceeded with a list of all the things that the Spirit was accomplishing through him in his ministry. Luke chapter 11 um, the Holy Spirit was no longer the purview of the spiritually elite God the Father was as willing to give every man the Holy Spirit as a father is willing as a mother is willing to give good things to their children in fact Jesus asserted that it is only through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we can be reborn and that's a prerequisite to entry into the kingdom of God. You find that in John chapter 3 verse 5. But one thing we don't usually talk about when we talk about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is that it was not a yes-no proposition all the time. What do I mean? Well, when Jesus sent, was still with his disciples, he sent out the twelve and then with the seventy and gave them power to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. These were all things that he asserted he could only do through the power of the Spirit of God in them. Now, if you saw someone raising the dead, would you attribute that to their skills, their power, or to a superhuman power? I know what I would attribute it to. But then, after he was resurrected, when Jesus was in the upper room, he walked through a locked door and shocked his disciples by appearing among them. This is found in John chapter 20. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. Hadn't they already received the Spirit? And yet now he's saying that they received the Spirit in a new way. And then comes Pentecost in the book of Acts when a rushing wind fills the room that the disciples are gathered in and flames of fire appear on their heart their heads and they start speaking foreign languages and and all of the foreigners in in Jerusalem hear this commotion as they spill out onto the street and they can understand they can understand what they're saying in their own language the holy spirit came in waves growing 
increasing in power. And I want to suggest that the same thing is true in every one of our lives. When I was a boy in Kansas, one day, it was a day like this, except Kansas doesn't have chiggers. <laughs> and so as a boy, I was free to go outside and lay down on the grass and look up into the sky. And it was a bottomless sky. Not a cloud in sight, just blue going on forever. And I was laying there when all of a sudden this hawk drifted across my vision and then drifted back. And soon it was circling above me. Don't worry, I wasn't dying. Okay, this was not a vulture. This was a hawk. And I noticed that it was getting smaller. You've probably seen birds do this. And then another hawk joined him, and another, and then a vulture came in, and pretty soon I had this whole menagerie of birds above me circling in the heavens, rising higher and higher and higher. And then suddenly the first hawk started zipping across the sky, just boom, wham, and he was flying like about out of Hades, okay, okay, and within seconds he was invisible to my eye, and one by one the birds got to that height and caught that wind and they were gone. Birds don't struggle up into the sky. They don't zip across the sky under their own power. They ride the wings of the wind, to use a biblical metaphor. They were rising the thermal, going up into the sky. Once they got up into the sky, they caught a crosswind, and they t rode that wind, not, if not into the sunset, at least a long distance. And friends, that to me is an expression of what the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Just like Frank Morris, the Holy Spirit is the secret that empowers us blind, weak, fallible humans to live life beyond our limits. Okay? A friend asked me this week what perspective I saw as writing injustice in this world. Because, frankly, I have, I have problems with the activism of today that spends so much time in making other people wrong in an effort to right injustice. Those injustices are real. That condemning others, demanding vengeance, reparations, doesn't heal injustice. It only generates a new layer of sensing of injustice while not repairing the old. What I'm talking about today, to me, is the secret of dealing with injustice. And the, the answer to injustice starts with me, the transformation of my life. And that transformation is infective. Others see it. Others will emulate it. Not everybody. This is not a panacea that suddenly, whom like COVID, spreads across the globe. The Bible tells us that in the end, God is going to have to draw a line in the sand and say, those of you that have accepted the solution to injustice can stay. Those of you who have not must go. Now that is a bitter pill. That is a bitter pill for Christians. That is a pit bitter pill for non-Christians. That's a bitter pill for the secular mind. But that's the touchstone of the biblical worldview that God offers us the power to live lives of justice and love for all men. 
promises to deal with the rest. Is the Holy Spirit a part of your life? I would assert that he is. If you're listening today, it's because you're responding to him. Okay? You may be spiraling in the sky. You know, when you're going around in a circle, it feels like you're going nowhere. And sometimes you are. Okay? But if you ride the winds of the Spirit, you will be spiraling up, 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 and eventually you will find your life transformed and you will be accomplishing the unimaginable, traveling at speeds you could never achieve, doing things, living lives. You could actually be a positive force in your marriage instead of that critical woe is me, selfish person that you find yourself being. I don't know what the issues are in your life, but, the, but Jesus offers you victory through the Spirit. And now I think I'm going to go chase an airplane because my grandson loves videos of mechanical things. What are you going to do with your Sabbath? Be safe, my friends. Please be prudent. At least here in the United States, COVID is raging nationwide again. And despite our efforts at making ourselves feel safe, I'm afraid it's going to get much, much worse. So be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. Have a great Sabbath.